Mary Magdalene interviews Jesus on the subject of humility. Session 2 is Humility in Practice. The interview took place in Bathurst, New South Wales, Australia, on the 14th of June, 2012. All right. Hi again, everyone. This is the second interview in my series of interviews with my soulmate, Jesus, uh, about humility. So in our first interview, we talked, it was basically an introduction to what is humility, uh, just trying to define what humility is and what it isn't. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, in this session, I'd really like to focus on practical aspects of humility, what it means to live um in a humble way, day to day, what that looks like in mm. our lives. So, um, that sounds good. Yeah, mm. I think this is this is my favourite bit okay. <laughs> where we get to get down to the nitty gritty of what it what it actually looks like. And um, yep. and as I said in the previous interview, I'm going to use some notes that you have prepared. A few, well, I think in 2009 these were written. Mm -hmm. um, I just feel there's a lot of fantastic content here, and mm. if we if um, if I perhaps just introduce the different points that you've written here and ask my own questions about that, mm. I feel like we could get into some good, we could cover some good uh, material yeah, in that way. Yeah, that sounds good. Okay. All right. So the first practical um, element or aspect of humility, what you've written here is God's love flowing into my heart depends upon my wholehearted desire to feel and experience all emotion. Mm -hmm. So um, before we talk about, obviously, this wholehearted desire to feel and experience all emotion, which is an aspect of humility, why have you prefaced it with God's love flowing into my heart depends upon this? Well, the, the beauty of God's love flowing into our heart is that it tells us when we're in a state of humility. Mm -hmm. so, so the reason why I've prefaced it like that is because my feelings are if you cannot feel God's love flowing into your heart, it's because you're already out of humility. So you're already not being humble. The f fact is, once we become at one with God, we will be able to feel God's love flowing into our heart every time we have a desire for it to flow mm -hmm. without any resistance. And that is a sign that we are truly humble. Mm -hmm. if, if we can't feel God's love flowing into our heart, then that is a sign that we're not humble, that there's, that there's more humility we have to develop. And if we understand what God's love flowing into our heart is dependent upon, then we will at least begin to address those particular points of what it's dependent upon, rather than just assuming... And I see a lot of people do this. They, they do not feel God's love flowing into their heart moment by moment, but they then go... Oh, that must be something wrong with God. You know, I think I've got everything right now. <laughs> so even if we don't think it, that might be what we're... That's yeah. the way we're avoiding the truth that we're not fully in a humble place. Exactly. We're, we're, but what we're basically doing there is we're saying, oh, I don't feel God's love flowing into my heart 24 by 7, but that's because there's something wrong with God. There's nothing wrong with me. I'm, I've got everything sorted out. Mm. And the reality is that is a very arrogant position. God's, God wants her love to flow into our heart all the time. If, our, if her love isn't flowing into our heart all the time, then it's because we either A, do not have a desire for it, or B, we are not humble enough. Now, if we do have moments where we do have a desire and yet the flow isn't occurring, then it's totally because we're not humble enough. Mm -hmm. It's be because we're resisting uh, true humility. And if we understand that, then we can understand the importance of humility in our day-to-day -day life in terms of receiving divine love. It seems like um, if I just dedicated my whole life's work to becoming a humble person, mm -hmm. <laughs> that would be all I need to do. That's all a person needs to do. Yeah. Every other truth can come to a person once they're humble, and all of God's love can come to a person to the point of atonement with God just by being humble. We don't need to learn anything else yeah. Yeah. aside hum from humility. Aside from humility. Mm. And I suppose for me, you know, there's often a sinking feeling of like, oh, I'm not feeling God's love flowing, so I'm obviously not humble. And I guess that's me not being humble as well by judging myself if I, if I then get down on myself about that. Certainly if you get down upon yourself about, about you know, God's love not flowing into you, then, then you're obviously feeling judgmental. And, and, and judgmentalness towards oneself is a very counterproductive mm -hmm. emotion. 
in that it, it, it's established through an arrogant condition of the environment. In other words, the environment judges us, so we judge us. It's very rare for a little child to judge itself without somebody in its environment first judging it. Yeah. And, and we need to understand that if we're going to become like a little child, we have to start removing these judgments from ourselves, about ourselves. Mm -hmm. And the only way we're going to do that is by starting to confront our environment with their judgments on mm -hmm. us as well. And, and once we get rid of a lot of those judgments, then we can start having a complete openness and that will help us a lot in our in our progress towards God in, and also our progress towards humility. Mm. If, if we're invested in other people's opinion of us, then we're invested in arrogance. And, yeah. and unfortunately, we're not going to progress very far when that happens. It's like we can be invested in God's opinion of us. That will lead us to humility. Always. Or we can be invested in what everyone else feels about us and that can only lead to lead us further away from God would you uh, say? Well at least stagnate us yeah. you know it, it can't lead us towards God yeah. because in the end uh, you know the only way that we can go towards God is to be completely open to God's opinion yeah. and and when we're in a state where we're examining the world's opinion or other people's opinion our environment's opinion of ourselves or even what we've learnt to to have an opinion about ourselves within ourselves and those opinions have to be given up and that requires humility to give them up yeah, because because they're going to be emotional to give them up. Yeah. yeah, yeah. When I feel about God's feelings about it, I can feel He's not in a state of judgment. With not me, at all. But and yet I'm still enforcing this thing. Exactly. Yeah. And God, all, all God feels is compassion that we have gone so far away from humility that we don't even recognize it anymore, and that we can't even be humble in seeing our own faults anymore. And we've so invested in other people's opinion of us and our own opinion of ourselves that we can't just see ourselves as we truthfully are. And God just looks upon us and goes with, with, with a degree of compassion and goes, well, when you can learn to see yourself as you truly are, then I can connect with you because I can only connect with you as you truly are, yeah. not with you, the, the facade, or with you, the injured person. Yeah. It's with you as you truly are that I need to connect with. And if that includes injuries, then sure, it, it will include the injuries. But the facade that we want to live in, which yeah. is the reason why we're invested in judgment, we need to give that up completely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Let's go back then to our first point, our first practical aspect of Good. humility, yep. which is that um, it is a wholehearted desire to feel and experience all emotion. Mm. So what, do, what does it look like when I passionately desire to feel all of my emotion? Well, well, firstly, you won't have any resistance to feeling any of your emotion. So, mm -hmm. so you, when you have a wholehearted desire, there's, if you think about the pendulum of desire, there's total resistance, then there's neutrality, and then there's wholehearted desire. And many people, when it comes to feeling their emotions, are in this total resistive place. Mm -hmm. They don't want to feel any desire because all they feel is that it's going to be painful, they're afraid of it, they're afraid of what it's going to look like, they're afraid of how they're going to be judged by it, and, and they are in, in aggressive resistance to feeling their desire, the, the emotion. Then we go into a state, generally after we've released some of that, we go into a state of neutrality with emotion where, where we're okay either way, you know, <laughs> where sometimes we get judged and sometimes we're not and we're sort of okay either way. But that's still not having a passionate desire to feel our emotion. When we have a passionate desire to feel our emotion, it becomes one of the very first things we choose to do in our life. Mm. It becomes more important to us than our job. It becomes more important to us than all of our relationships because we know that all of our relationships are defined by our ability to do it. And it becomes more important than almost all other things in our life, uh, aside from our relationship with God. And the whole reason why we do it is because we want that relationship yeah. with God and because we want that relationship with God as our first priority in our life, we, we want to embrace the process of feeling all of our emotions. We, we don't go into a place where we're shutting ourselves down all the time. Or we're trying, reluctant. Or, or like, we're reluctant. Oh, I've got to feel it. Yeah. 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 We have a passionate, burning desire to feel. We, we, it doesn't mean that we manufacture feelings, mm. but whenever a feeling comes up, we embrace it. We don't, we don't reject it. We don't push it away. We don't control it. We don't try to shut it down for ourselves in terms of how it looks to ourselves or because we think we're going crazy or any other reason, and we don't shut it down for the benefit of anybody else either. We, however, experience it in a loving way. We don't project it outwardly in a negative way towards other people. 
we experience it in a loving way. And if that means being alone, we choose to be alone and feel it. Yeah. And we don't feel it in an addictive manner. We don't mm. try to have our addictions met through the emotion. We embrace the emotion without addiction. Yeah. And something you've written here is that our longing for God's love becomes stronger than our longing for any other experience. Yes. And this is what leads us into humility. Yes. Which is very powerful, isn't it? When yes. I think about all of the other experiences that we've built into our life and our day-to-day -day life, um, if God's love and receiving God's love was to surpass all of those things emotionally, yes. we might say we want that, but if it was emotionally to happen would streamline everything again <laughs> yeah well the the thing we need to bear in mind there is if if we definitely emotionally wanted that to occur we would not be any in any place of resistance at all we would be we would be constantly desirous of feeling absolutely everything because we know that our very relationship with god and therefore our very uh our, our entire possibilities for our future which are dependent upon our relationship with god are all dependent upon our experiencing the emotion right now. Mm. And, and so we won't go into a place of resistance to the emotion. We won't try to avoid the emotion in that particular moment. And if you look at it, the only reason why we would attempt to avoid an emotion at any point in time is because we are worried more about our relationship with others or our relationship with ourselves mm. than we are about our relationship with God. The only reason why we would avoid an emotion uh, under those circumstances, is because something else has a higher priority in our life other than God. Yeah. So, so if God had the true highest priority in our life, we would not choose to avoid our emotions for any reason, including mm -hmm. how it might look, including our potential humiliation, including any of those other uh, things that might come up in terms of how it, how it might seem to others. We're not invested in other people's opinion of us doing it. We're not invested in how they perceive us. We're not even invested in how we perceive ourselves. Yeah. We're not worried that we're going crazy because <laughs> we, we know that in this place, only by choosing to feel our emotions can we get closer to God. And getting closer to God is our number one priority. Yeah. And when we're truly humble, it is our number one priority. Yeah. Okay, so... That kind of touches on a few of the other points that you've, you've put down here because you, you talked about not being invested in our relationships with other people and also I suppose inherent in that is if we're, if we're um, honouring God's love or the desire for God's love above other things then we won't be afraid to confront the error that surrounds us either through that process. Mm. And something that you've written here is about... Um, Am, like, am I, if I'm really humble, am I willing to lose family, friends, property, position, power, um, everything. everything in order to receive God's love? Mm. If you're truly humble you're, you, and God is your number one priority and your relationship with God is of, of, of first importance to you, then everything else uh, takes a dim second, uh, second row, really, in terms, of, in terms of our priority system. That being the case... We're not we're, we're, like it's almost unimportant to us that we're going to lose friends. Mm. It's almost unimportant to us that we're going to lose, potentially lose family, potentially, you know, lose uh, other people's good opinion, potentially in business lose, uh, you know, business or lose, you know, what other people perceive uh, their honor or respect. Mm. Because all of those things are nowhere near as important to us as our relationship with God. And so, so we have this beautiful ability when we're humble then to, to truly see our priority system, mm -hmm. to understand how important this relationship with God is in our day-to-day -day life and why we're seeking it, and that all other things come to us as a result of it. It's having the faith, isn't it, that if I go for this thing, then whatever I lose along the way, other things will be added to me or... It will only confront the error. Well, initially you might not even have that faith. Yeah. But because your relationship with God is your number one priority, yeah. that won't even matter. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it's, you're not even invested in any of those things anymore. You, you, see, you see, the things we place in our priority systems are all to do with our investments. Mm. They're all to do with really a lot of times our addictions. Our addictions get met through our investments. 
And if we're only invested in our relationship with God, in which there can be no addiction, um, then it's impossible for us to, to have a competing investment that's more important uh, with our, than a, our relationship with God. And so whenever one of those competing investments come up, whatever the addiction is that we, we have that, that is coming up emotionally, we'll just naturally embrace it and experience it. Because, we'll just be humble to that experience. Because why would we not want to be? Yeah. We, 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 we feel that our relationship with God is of, the, of supreme importance. This other thing is of secondary, if secondary, mm. you know, because uh, next to no importance in comparison. Mm. So why would we remain invested in it? Why would we emotionally remain invested in it? A person who's humble doesn't. A person who's humble just feels it, mm. just feels it without the investment because they know that the, the, um, the relationship with God is their number one priority. And they might not even have any faith at that point mm. that it will bring them anything. Mm. It's just that they want to have a relationship with God. It's a bit like if I badly want a relationship with you, I'm not going to let the telly interfere with our relationship. <laughs> I'm not going to let my children interfere with our relationship. And I'm not going to let my friends interfere <coughs> with, with, with the relationship itself. I will be completely focused on our relationship in all aspects of my life. I'm not going to let my mates interfere. You know, if my mates say, oh, you know, I don't know, you know, they might make criticisms or whatever. Yeah. I'll say, no, this relationship with this woman is the most important thing to me. Now, if my relationship with God is the most important thing, even my relationship with you is going to be less important yeah. than my relationship with God. And therefore, I'm going to be humble in my experience with you yeah. every single moment. Yeah. Um, humble all the time. Mm. And this is the beauty of embracing it in that priority system. So when I have this passionate desire for God's love and that passionate desire exceeds my desire for all other things... I will be automatically very, very humble, willing to experience every emotion, every criticism, every mm. loss, anything that could come upon, every shame I have, every potential shame I have, every mm. potential fear as well as every fear. I'll be able to act in harmony with that relationship every time without compromise because it's the thing of most importance. Yeah. And I'm humble enough to acknowledge that it is the thing of most importance. Yeah. Yeah. And and I suppose in summary of a lot of things that you've said there, points you've written here is that I'd be willing to look foolish and stupid in the eyes of those around me. Very important. Um but continue to receive God's love. Yeah, why would I not? Like yeah. because God is the most important thing to me. At times other people in the world think God's a stupid concept. Yeah. There are people in the world who believe God doesn't exist. They believe that anybody who invests their life in God in terms of any in, in any any way is stupid mm -hmm. now i'm going to risk feeling from those people that that they would project at me that i'm stupid but i'll be willing to do that because my priority system is in place my relationship with god is yeah. number one priority and i'm willing to feel that emotion as yeah. a result and in fact i think it's quite contentious to put anything above family on the planet at the it moment. Is. Yeah. You know, yeah. If you put anything above family, you're already in a taboo, mm -hmm. uh, even if it is a relationship with God. Yeah. I feel that emotion exists within most people. So. Yeah, and that reminds me of that interview we had with David Milliken. You remember how you know, he said, so, so you're saying that you've come here to break up families, and, and he, he never played this part of the interview, but I said to him, but your Jesus said, that I come to make en enemies between mother and son, father and daughter and husband and wife and so forth. The reality is that, that while we didn't come to make enemies, the truth is that there are times when those people would perceive themselves to be our enemy mm -hmm. because their priority system is different to ours. If our priority system is God number one, number two, the soulmate, soulmate union, and number three, the family that soulmate union creates. Number four, um, you know, all <laughs> all other people. Yeah. Um, if our priority system is that, there are times when the addictions of other people in that priority system get challenged. Yeah. And as a result, those people will become upset and potentially angry. And even so, I will still be humble enough to feel all of that and still embrace my relationship with God and still be humble enough to feel every emotion that creates as a result of their attack. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, and that's 
that's being willing to feel all the emotions about what I might lose on mm-hmm. my path to alignment with God. Because a lot of times we have fears about the future as well, not yes. just about the present. So there are things that are happening in our life right now. And then there's the things that potentially might happen if we fully embrace mm-hmm. God first. And my suggestion to people is, like, if you're not fully embracing God first and you say you're on the divine love path, then you're not humble yet. Because once you fully embrace God first, you'll find all of these other aspects of your life get challenged and that's fantastic. They need to be challenged yeah. and they, they need to be released. And we need to be in a humble place where we allow all that to happen. Yeah, yeah, mm. absolutely. Mm. Yeah. yeah, and uh, willingness to feel all of the emotions about being alone, mm-hmm. being attacked, being belittled, just to be ourselves. Just to be ourselves. Yeah. And, yeah. and bearing in mind that when we feel our emotions in a truthful manner, we are being ourselves. Even if those emotions are injured, we're still being ourselves much more than we were when we were in the facade. Definitely. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. There's a few things you've listed that we would never do Mm -hmm. if we were, uh, you know, in this wholehearted desire to feel and experience everything. So the first one is um, that we would never attempt to use methods or techniques that shut down or dampen our emotional experience. Yes. I see a lot of uh, people in spiritual persuasions constantly trying to use techniques that that are all about trying to reprogram their emotions really mm-hmm. and they don't want to just feel the emotion that's present they want to try to transform it into something different and they use all of these techniques and some of these techniques are intellectually based some of them are fear based and some of them are almost religious belief system based in the mm-hmm. sense that a belief system is created to manage the emotion Um, So, for example, you see in many forms of religion, a belief system that God is an angry God is created to manage an emotion. And Mm. the emotion is this emotion of, I feel like I'm going to get punished when I have a relationship with God. And, you know, I feel like that's what God wants to do. And so I want to believe in a punishing God. I want God to punish other people. So therefore, I have to believe in a punishing God Mm. for that to occur. These are all emotions that I would give up if i if i actually experience my own emotions yeah. in a humble manner but instead of doing that i create a whole series of belief systems that support my emotional injury yeah. and we would never choose to do that if we were truly humble yeah and and i think of really practical things in my day-to-day life that i do to dampen down my emotional experience mm. you know Sometimes it's having a hot cup of tea, yep. uh, dependent on sometimes when I have tea, it's not about that. But, yep. you know, often I catch myself trying to soothe myself rather than feel the rawness to of To calm experience. oneself down. Yeah. yeah. And, and um, to I'm, make people, uh, quite often it's the times when we get out of control that we get close to our emotions. Yeah. And yet you see people trying to get back into control. Also, it's time, you often see them using food. Yeah. as a as a main way to get it you know back in control or you see them engaging like avoiding certain types of people yeah. to get things back in control a person who's humble doesn't do any of those things a person who's humble just feels the feeling first yeah. Yeah. before any of those things so they know why they're going for a cup of tea or a cup of coffee or they know why you know why they just walked around that side of the street when they saw the other person <laughs> coming they know because they could feel the emotion. They yeah. they can feel the emotion that they're trying to avoid. And I suppose there's there's stages, isn't there? Like I used to do all those things in automatic. Mm-hmm. Now I'm aware of the emotion, but still doing them. Often still doing them. Sometimes I go, no, yeah. I'm going to just go for real humility yeah. here. Yeah. Um, so true humility. I wouldn't even consider them anymore. I would just be fully embracing everything. Yeah, so you, you'd see someone who you're afraid of walking down the street towards you and you, go, and you, you might still feel fear Yeah. because that, that yeah. might still be an emotion in you, but you would walk towards them and engage the situation. And often I find now it's when things like that happen, I think, oh, here's God answering my <laughs> prayer to deal with my fear. Yep, thanks God, now I feel afraid. I'm going to... This is your gift to me, really. I, I kind of have that feeling. Yeah. I'm still terrified sometimes. And it's so. remarkable how many people are not humble in their prayers because we often pray for God to show us something. God shows us something or creates a circumstance that shows us something and we go out of our way to avoid it. Yeah. And, and therefore we're going out of our way to be arrogant because yeah. if we were truly humble, we'd embrace it. We'd go, well, God... You're pretty low, lovely guy. You've just sent me another, you know, another, you know, thing, another situation 
to to challenge myself and help myself become more humble and and feel more of my emotion and if i can embrace this situation it's going to be wonderful Mm -hmm. and it's such a loving god doing that for us all the time and yet what we do instead oftentimes we go oh my law of attraction is really bad you know why does this law of attraction be so bad we hear people say this all the time and the reason why they're saying that is because they are still used to managing humility they Mm -hmm. they want to they they're trying to have a facade of humility if if you if you if you have to manage your life then there's a facade of humility yeah a person who's humble doesn't need to manage their life they just embrace their life fully Mm -hmm. allow everything to get to get triggered that gets triggered emotionally and and they come out of the other side purified yeah and you know as you talk about it i smell the freedom in it it just smells like freedom just just feel everything be where you are Embrace every experience that's there. Yeah. And yet as I live this day to day, the fear, the terror, really, terror, let's yeah. say, this terror in me. Well, one of the first emotions that a person needs to get over with regard to humility is terror. So, so being humble enough to experience your terror, if you're humble enough to experience your terror, you will be humble enough to experience most other emotions. Yeah. But mo- what I see most people doing with their terror is they avoid it or manage it. And so therefore they are not humble enough to experience their terror. Yeah. And as a result of that, they'll only selectively be humble with other emotions. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I've been praying for a week about fear and okay, God, let's do this fear thing. And I've had a couple of opportunities to, you know, confront fear. And this morning I woke up in, te- or you touched a spot on my back and I was in utter terror mm-hmm. and that's where real humility is tested, isn't it? Because I go, okay, I want fear, but I don't want terror. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> this is too much. I, I don't understand how to feel this. This feels out of control. Uh, I don't even physically know what it's... It's not coming to me what it's about. It's just a visceral feeling. And if you were passionately mm-hmm. humble, what would be, what would you do? You'd, you'd get out, you'd sit up, you'd start writing about the terror Whatever in your life and yeah. you know the terrifying events in your life about man and you would just... You know, immediately you would do that if you're humble. You wouldn't. You wouldn't wait for another person to encourage you to do it. You wouldn't wait for me to create the right space for you <laughs> yeah. to do it. You would yeah. just automatically embrace that particular process because that is what being humble means. Yeah. Most people are yet to arrive at that place. Yeah. Uh, most people who I know that are, or who I've met who claim to be on you know the path towards God, whether they're you know on so-called the divine love path or any other religious path have yet to be that humble. Mm. Um, And I see that happening in day-to-day life all the time where an emotion of terror is exposed and almost any, every person I've ever met, when it's an emotion of terror is exposed, that's when true humility is tested and most people do not have the humility to actually go through that emotion of terror. Um, So terror is an interesting test of our humility. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, and there's a few other things we would never do. Mm-hmm. We'd never get angry, resentful, or afraid about having to feel our own emotions. Yeah, so we wouldn't be rageful at God about the law of attraction and what it's brought us today. Um, and really, when you think about it, it's not the law of attraction that brought us that particular thing. It's the unhealed soul, uh, emotional condition that's brought us. So it's something inside of ourselves yeah. anyway. Yeah. Um, but we, we wouldn't have this tendency to blame externally everything. Um, you know, a person who's truly humble looks firstly at themselves. They don't, they don't, they don't blame the external environment or situation first. They always look at themselves, and a part of looking at themselves is looking at the situation. Um, but they don't avoid the situation or themselves in the process. Yeah, yeah. I found some old journals of mine uh, the other day, so from four years ago, and it's full of this resentment and rage at. God, this system, and I, uh, you know, At it's me. just too. It's got a lot of it back then, wasn't yeah. it? Because <laughs> you, you were uh, presenting me with humility or with truth, and my humility was non-existent. Uh, so there was uh, a lot of, a lot of that, and a lot of this next point, which is, I would never, I, I was feeling like I'm giving up on things or losing things because of choosing this path. And when yeah. I'm really humble, I would never feel either of those things. And four years later, I'm happy to say I feel the complete opposite. I feel everything has been gifted to me through this path. Yeah. But um, that's been, a, you know, that's developed as my humility has developed. Yeah, if you, if you look at this whole aspect of feeling that you're losing things, 
that means if you look at it truthfully that means that you believe that you've got things <laughs> to lose <laughs> yeah. right and and that to me is a pretty remarkable proposition considering that we're when we begin our process towards god we're totally removed from god generally like and and yet we believe we've got things mm. and and in my mind and in my heart my feelings are it's impossible to have anything without god yeah so so bearing that in mind this whole concept that i'm giving things up you know like oh i'm giving up uh, caffeine or i'm giving up <laughs> alcohol or I'm giving up eating meat you know what a sacrifice you know <laughs> And all of these uh, ideas of sacrifice, they're all based around emotional injuries that a humble person would just feel. Mm -hmm. And they actually, a truly humble person doesn't um, feel all the time a resistance to giving things up. Yeah. Because it, cause they know that everything, like if your relationship again with God is the highest priority, then what are these other things in comparison? And one of the things we're not understanding at that point is that actually if I embrace my relationship with God, everything, every beautiful thing comes to me. Mm. I, my, my whole life will be enhanced in ways that I, at this point in time, cannot even imagine. And, and I need to have at least some faith in that concept. Yeah, and that's what it feels like to me. I was trying to hold on to things that didn't have a substance. They're like sand now. To, yeah. You know, just... Just... And, and they weren't even real, many of them, like holding on to the good opinion of another person when in reality you didn't have the good opinion of the other person. I was working for it all yeah, the time. you're working for it all the time. Yeah. And the reality is if you have the good opinion from another person, you would never lose it through you doing something that challenges them. And in fact, doing something wouldn't challenge them if you had their yeah. good opinion. So, so the reality is we get a lot of things challenged as we get closer to and God. And that's been a beautiful gift for me mm. is that when I've decided to really risk what's felt like a risk uh, to be humble and risk loss my perceived loss yeah. I've seen I've seen what wasn't real anyway and I've seen what actually did have substance and yes. I oftentimes wasn't aware of it like relationships that actually had some substance yeah um, which I which I kind of everything was on a level playing field except maybe when I was in more addiction with people I valued that relationship more than the relationships than the, that had substance yes yeah. and when I've just decided to strive and strive to be more myself and go for my relationship with God um, yeah th those addictive relationships a lot of them fell away very rapidly and I was left uh, looking at people who had actually seen something in me that I hadn't even seen yep. or yep. who respected my difference uh, just yep. as much as they And really, in a way, marriage. they are the people who saw you at more as you truthfully are than saw the, you know, the, the facade. facade. Yeah. And so therefore, they saw more of your real self and therefore, um, you know, you know, often we reject those people who see more of our real selves yeah. because we're not humble enough to accept that self that they see. It's so mm. true, isn't it? Mm. But this is why I feel like it feels so so much like a risk or a loss when actually now the the beautiful truth is it's a gift. Mm. And now I see things with a totally different... Um, yeah. yeah. People don't understand how hard maintaining a facade actually is. Yeah. Um, it's exhausting. It, it, like, like I just see people with their lives like exhausting themselves. You know, I quite often liken it to juggling nine balls. And, and that's what they're doing in their life. They're juggling. How does that person see me? How does this person see me? How does my family perceive me? How, does oh, my, no, I've done how that do my friends perceive me? Yeah. Oh, I've dropped that ball. I've got to pick that up while I'm, yeah. while I'm still juggling these other yeah. eight balls and then throw them back into the mix. And their whole life is so busy juggling everything, juggling all their work, you know, their workmates and how they perceive them, all their friends and how they perceive them, how their family, how they perceive them, their children even and how they perceive them and how they perceive themselves, you know, all in the facade. And, and I just say, like, you just need to stop juggling and just drop all the balls. Mm. Like, that's what humility does. Mm. Humility says, no, you don't have to juggle anything anymore. You just need to feel why you're juggling everything. Yeah. That's all you need to do. Yeah. And once you get into that place, you're willing to feel you're willing to drop all the balls. The only reason why we keep all the balls up, you know, juggling mm -hmm. them, is because we're unwilling to drop a perception of ourselves mm -hmm. that we wish to retain. And we have no hope of accepting God's perception of ourselves in this state. 
to, to set God's perception of ourselves, we're going to have to drop every perception that we imagine or feel from our environment or from ourselves. We're going to have to drop all of those perceptions and a truly humble person is willing to do that. Yeah. And then just let it all be a mess on the ground and then start seeing which bits are you know, uh, what God created and which bits are just the facade or the injury mm. that, that we need to release. Yeah. Yeah. So that's our first point was really about um, God's love flowing into our heart, being dependent on a whole hearted desire to feel and experience everything, all emotion. So we're really talking about the whole heart desire to feel everything. Yes. So that, that's the main point of that se- section. Yeah. We need to develop within ourselves a wholehearted desire to feel everything, not, not a, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll do it if I have to, or <laughs> yeah. oh, I, I suppose I have to, the law of attraction is bringing me the event, or being resistive all the time, but rather a passionate desire to do it. Yeah, which, mm. is, which is so beautiful, isn't it? Yep. But it, it does take work to develop that from where we are in our injured state. Mo- and it, needs to, it also takes a, a d- desire to release every perception we have of ourselves and every addiction we have of other people perceiving ourselves a certain way. Yeah. And that's why it's so hard to do. Because, yeah. because, and that's why humility is one of the reasons why humility is difficult, as we'll talk about later. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Okay, I... We've kind of led into another point on this list. So I think if we go to that now, Mm -hmm. which is about God's love can only flow into my heart when I'm willing to be as I truthfully am. And you've already started to touch on that a little bit. Did we miss the point, this point though? Yeah, I was just going to come back to it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No worries. Are you happy to do that? Sure, I think the next point, though, flows on from the previous, okay, perhaps. Okay, let, let's um, leave yeah. that one and go to this one then. So the next one then is God's love flowing into my heart depends upon my willingness to take responsibility for, experience and release fully, <laughs> without reservation, all the error within myself that prevents God's love from flowing. Yeah, I think the reason why I wanted to mention this next is mm-hmm. because... If you look at the previous one, it was talking about having a passionate desire of developing a... Pa- like if we're humble, we will have a passionate desire to feel everything. Mm-hmm. This one's having a passionate desire to take responsibility for everything. Yeah, which is different, isn't Which it? is different in a way. It's, like, it's sort of like one is having a passionate desire to feel everything. One is taking, having, taking responsibility for everything we feel. Mm. You see, quite often I see a lot of, a lot, what a lot of people do with their emotions is they they want to blame other people all the time, you know, for their experience. Now, while our environment has has played a large part in creating all of our emotions, it's impossible for any of those people who even created our emotions to actually release them for us. Yeah. And this point honours that. Yes. A person who is humble knows that only they can actually take responsibility for everything that's in them now mm. and actually go through the process of desiring to release everything that's inside of them. A person who's truly humble doesn't say, oh, well, that person created my emotion, so I'm going to wait until that person's all sorry about that. Because at the end of the day, the person who's truly humble knows that even if the other person is sorry, and even if the other person has completely repented and they feel terrible about what they've done, unless I take responsibility for the emotion that's in me, it's still going to remain in me. Yeah, yeah. And if you're truly humble, you'll come to realise that it is pointless waiting for anybody else to change when you, have, you are the only person who has the power to change you. Yeah. So it's pointless waiting... If I'm truly humble, I will never wait for somebody else to say they're sorry before I change, before I forgive them. Mm. I will never wait for somebody else to have some you know, rev- revelation of truth that causes them to change and treat me better yeah. before I forgive them for how they're already treating me. Yeah. I will always firstly address my own emotions because I know that that if I'm humble, I have to know that... Only I can actually take responsibility for the feeling of my own feelings and my own pain and my own suffering. And in fact, all of my own feelings, including my own joys. I often see people 
who are not very humble, wanting other people to share in their joy as well. Yeah. See, that's the mark of a lack of humility as well. But the reality is we, we can sit and watch a sunset and feel all this joy without having to share it when we're truly humble. Mm. because we're fully engaged in our own experience. We take full responsibility for our own experience. We're not addicted to another person sharing it with us. Mm. Yeah, there's mm. a lot in that, isn't there? Mm. Like, Often we're waiting for validation, aren't we? Mm-hmm. To valid- uh, permission to feel. Permission to feel, validation. Uh, we often cannot feel joy without somebody else feeling joy along with us. Mm-hmm. We, and Which is really about validation as well, isn't it's it? It's really about validation, but it's also about... Uh, their joy heightens our joy, so it's about an addiction to their joy yeah. rather than actually feeling the experience itself. Yeah. So we're addicted to the joy of them feeling the experience rather than just feeling our own experience. Yeah. So there's a lot of things in that that are about a lack of humility. When we're truly humble, we will feel our own experience without expecting a single other person to share the experience because we know that only we can feel the feelings of our experience. Yeah, and I see that people, when it comes to personal pain and suffering, things that have happened in our life, I see that um, people can get, myself included, get caught on two sides of this coin. Mm -hmm. One is where we want to blame, we want the person to change, acknowledge they were wrong, and then we'll feel like we will feel, which is a bit of a fallacy anyway, isn't it? Very much so, because... when, no. when you go through all of that, you still realize that inside of yourself, you still haven't felt it. And inside of yourself, you're still going to have to go through forgiveness. And while it might be a touch easier now that the other person's felt, you've now made your entire relationship with God dependent upon this other person changing, which is in a very humble place with mm-hmm. God. Because mm-hmm. God's saying, I want a relationship with you. And you're saying, oh, I only want a relationship with you, God, when this person's sorry. Yeah. And, and, and God's going, why would you wait till then? That might be a thousand years time. Why do you want to wait till then before you have a relationship with me? Why not have a relationship with me now? Yeah. And we go, oh, because I, I'd still want that, you know, yeah. like because we're too arrogant to go through the emotion of forgiveness where we actually forgive the person for what they've done and we no longer, and we work through the, our own experiences enough to do so, so that, so that we can have this relationship with God. Then our relationship with God is completely independent of yeah. our relationship with anyone else. And, if God is number one in our life, shouldn't that be the case? Like, would you, like if, if, if we were having a relationship as we are, and I was saying to you, oh, I've got to wait till my son Caleb uh, approves of you yeah. before we can have a relationship. Now, Caleb does, but you know, if that was just an <laughs> illustration. But um, I have to wait until Caleb approves of you before I have an emotion, a, a, a relationship with you. Then what if Caleb spends 25 years re- you know, rejecting that, mm. then I'm going to spend 25 years rejecting you. Now, now, that would demonstrate to you that Caleb has more importance to me than you do. That's the priority system. That's the priority right? system. Again. And so what we're often demonstrating to God, we often say, oh, God, I want a relationship with you. And at the very same time, we're demonstrating to God that we're not really sincere about that because we actually want the relationship with this person and that person and this person more. Mm. Right? Yeah. And, and that's not... A relationship, a, a relationship with God is not possible under those circumstances. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that was the other side of the to- coin. I was going to say, you know, we can get caught in blame and demand that mm. they acknowledge things or justice. Mm. We want justice. And on the other side of the coin, I see that we can get stuck with um, no one else in my family system is acknowledging my pain. Um, Oh, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it didn't happen. Even though I, there's suffering and pain inside of me, I, I feel like I'm not allowed to feel it or it's wrong to feel it, it's disrespectful to feel well, it. Well, maybe it didn't even happen. Yeah. You've got all these I emotions. I second but guess myself. Yeah. yeah. But the reality is if you were humble, you would just say, no, I have these emotions. And even if they're totally wrong, I still have them. And I need to take responsibility And I need to feel them. them. And that's the thing that I feel as you're talking about this is that we're saying, where's God in our priority system? And then where's ourselves in exactly. our priority system? Next. Yeah. So there's God in our priority system and then there's ourselves next because we have to honour ourselves enough to be humble. This is the beauty of humility. Humility teaches us that we must honour ourselves. Mm. That's the beauty of humility. Because when we're truly humble, we will honour our entire experience. We will actually feel our entire experience without resistance. Mm. That is honouring ourselves. 
And so true humility allows us to honour ourselves. Mm. Whereas arrogance doesn't allow us to honour ourselves. It allows us to honour the public opinion the of ourselves, yeah. the facade. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, right. Okay, so this willingness to take responsibility that we're talking about, we've said that it it means we want to take full responsibility for all of our actions also. Yes. And not blame that on anyone else. Yes. Um, and a longing to feel all of the pain inside of myself that's mm-hmm. already there. If we can go to the actions, for example. Oh, yes, sorry. Um, if we look at the actions, it's like we would never, we would never say, oh, but such and such made me do that. Mm. Or, oh, I did that because, and come up with some kind of explanatory reason why we acted in an un- unloving manner. Because a, a person who's humble will go, no, I acted in an unloving manner, and it was wrong, and I need to feel about it. Yeah, and this is interesting. Um, I know a lot of parents say, um, well, I was doing the best I could with the resources I had at the time, uh, and they use that as a way of dismissing the unloving actions that they've taken. Yeah. And to me, a truly humble person would say, would acknowledge, that was unloving. I did an unloving thing. I need to take responsibility for it. While at the same time feeling I was doing the best I could. Yeah. It's almost that um, we, we kind of get rid of the responsibility part and just go for, well, I was doing the best I could. Could, and that's not really humble, is it? No, not at all. Yeah. Not at all. We need to take a completely opposite approach when we're humble. When we're humble, we, we look at our actions. It's like when I, when I first saw myself as a parent, I said to my father, and I remember this conversation still, I said to my father, Dad, I've been a pretty bad parent. Right? And I started to explain the reasons why. My father got very angry with me. Hmm. And I said, why are you start?" He said, no, you've been a good father. And I said, why do you want to believe I've been a good father when I know <laughs> that I haven't been? Mm. That, you know, that, I, that I've done things that are out of harmony with love, that my boys uh, have has spent a lot of their emotional time having to work their way through. And particularly how I treated women, taught them to treat women in a certain manner that they've now both had to work their way through a lot of emotions about. And I said to him, why, why are you so invested in in wanting to portray me as a good father mm. and he made a comment um straight after that which was if if i hadn't been a good father then what does that make him mm. because he hadn't done the things i'd done with my with with me mm. he'd actually been a lot more distant with me than i was with my own children so he then felt so much judgment by just me saying that i've been a bad father mm he felt that that meant that he'd been a worse one. Yeah. <laughs> um, because in his own mind, he felt that he was a worse one than I. And so, and so this is what happens a lot. If, if a person's in a true state of humility, they would allow themselves to feel that. Yeah. They would allow themselves to feel that emotion. And they will be honest about it. They won't be self-attacking about it mm-hmm. or, or self-critical or trying to pull themselves down or trying to get someone's commiseration they'll be wanting to address the real emotional reasons why. They want to take personal responsibility for their actions mm. and for their unloving behaviour. Mm. Mm. Yeah, and that probably leads to the next point, is that when we want to take responsibility, we desire with all our heart to experience the law of compensation for yes. what we've done to others. So, so in other words, if, uh, if we are truly repentant and sorry for what we've done, we won't be... Uh, always trying to avoid talking about what we've done. Yeah. We won't be always trying to avoid any criticism about what we've done. Mm. You know, people often get quite uh, stymied when they speak with me because they come up with me and they say, you did this and you did that and, and, and some of those things might have been unloving and I go, yes, I have done those things. <laughs> and and it's sort of a, almost the opposite to what they're expecting because what they're expecting is an argument about that yeah. and and I say well I have done those things so 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 what does that mean and they say well that means that you can't be Jesus or whatever mm. and I go well okay you're allowed to have that belief too if that's what you want to like I know who I am but mm. <laughs> you can have that belief if you want to um, but it but the two don't logically meet yeah like you know it's not a logical supposition coming from 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 that place certainly based in uh common christian 
of course, belief yeah. systems, applying that as logic. Exactly. Around, yeah. yeah, and so it's applying their false beliefs as logic is not a logical is yeah. not a logical proposition. And what makes me laugh is many of these people aren't Christians. Exactly. But they're using Christian logic. Yes. So yes, and, and which which indicates how strongly these entrenched belief systems have affected them in their environment. Yeah. And how strongly it's caused them to have a, de- a group of emotions that they don't want to feel. Yeah. Um, and if they were truly humble, they'd want to feel that rather than attacking me. Yeah. Um, because I've had to be truly humble about all the things I've done. Yeah. yeah. And this idea of desiring to experience the law of compensation, that really means that we just don't have a resistance. So every harm that I've done to you, I would not put up any resistance. In fact, I would actually want to know what how kind it's of felt. pain that mm, caused you exactly yeah. we wouldn't be so we often see parents going um to children oh aren't you over that by now mm. oh, yes i did that but aren't you over that by now and, and that's the mark of a truly arrogant person mm. a person who attacks another person or or hurts another person in their life and then and then blames the other person when they're not over it has yet to be humble yeah. and yet to feel the full effects of the law of compensation on their own heart yeah. and and the truth is, if we were truly humble, we'd be the opposite of that. We'd be going, I've really hurt you, son or daughter. You know, I've really hurt you. And, and I'm happy to hear you feelings about it, you know. There'd and be no time limit, would there, ever? No, no. no but you, you may have some, uh, you know, if the person's yelling and screaming at you about it, then obviously, you know, uh, you, might, you might go, well, you know, I don't know if I can handle the yelling and screaming all the time. But even then, you'd be mindful of the fact mm. that, there's so much hurt in this person that you created that they're yelling and screaming. That's a lot of hurt. Yeah. And, uh, and surely you do deserve some of it yeah. from, a, from, a, from a point of view of the fact that you created some of this hurt in them. Well, it's even, I suppose I feel like, not even that I deserve it, but if I really want to feel the pain or you know, be aware of the pain in this person, uh, I would just be acknowledging wow this is how much they're hurting and this is how much it's not only they're hurting this is how much i I have created so much hurt for them yeah and and this is where most of us want to avoid we might we 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 want to go oh they are hurting as if their hurt come from some you know other source (laughs) (laughs) other than what they're complaining about and now sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't but uh but the reality is, we, if we're humble, we would just allow that experience anyway. We, mm. we wouldn't be re- overreacting to it. We wouldn't be attacking in return. We'd just be humble to the experience. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah it, I know that this area that we're talking about now is often where people get quite heavy when we talk about this stuff because these are the emotions almost that we're trained to avoid and well that's we... only because nobody wants to take personal responsibility exactly like they don't want to take personal responsibility for what they've created we've created because of the the things of what happened in our childhood and what we've grown up and then the choices we made we've created generally the average person's created a lot of unloving events in their life and some more than others but yeah. you know the reality is we've created these unloving events how are we ever going to be get closer to God if we if we keep keep refusing to acknowledge that we've created them. Yeah. It's impossible yeah. because a person who comes to God comes to God with a humble heart. A humble heart is a is a heart that that is also contrite and repentant for what it's done. A humble heart is a a person who desires to try to rectify what they've done even. And so and they don't they don't worry about what it appears to be to other people in that process they'll just be humble in the process yeah and i you know this has been a theme coming up for us in book club um, repetitively around repentance and something that i'm really um, desiring to develop within myself this contrite heart as well um, because i know that i've caused much pain in my life also but the reason i brought up that it gets heavy for everyone is because you know it most of us are very resistive to this state of taking responsibility and what I notice is a tendency um, for many of us to go okay I'm going to take responsibility I'll be repentant or I'll even just desire to uh, look at the law of compensation of things that I've caused and then very quickly go into a self-punishing state which Mm. is not humility either is it? No and in fact the self-punishment is almost a state of arrogance as Mm. well because we're really saying to ourselves 
that uh, we have to be punished for things that often have entered us from other sources. Secondly, uh, we often want commiseration when we're self-punishing. We often mm. want people to come along and go, oh, you don't have to do that. Um, we're often not willing to take responsibility when we self-punish in terms of look at the actual reason why we did things. Mm. And we often do not let ourselves feel the emotions of what we created in other people yeah. because we're so self-absorbed feeling our own. So we've gone from one form of avoidance right into another. Which, which is, is also a position of arrogance. Yeah. <laughs> so we've gone from one form of arrogance to another form of yeah. arrogance without, without actually mm. dealing with the emotion. And the next point is about um, desiring with all our heart to, when we when we want to take responsibility in this humble place, uh, desiring with all our heart to experience the causal emotions of what happened to me in the past, mm. which is very often the reasons why we've caused harm to other people. Always it? the reasons. And it's the avoidance, the choices exactly. we've made in avoiding the causal emotions that always results in us harming another. Yeah. So when we're truly humble, we will want to find the reason. And if the reason's shameful, we'll want to feel our shame. And if the reason is, you know, hurtful or painful within it, we'll want to feel the pain because we don't want to create the pain in another person. Yeah. And that, so we are so humble that we're willing to feel our own pain and we're willing to feel the reasons why we've created pains in other people so that we never do that again. Yeah, mm. and I, like I just have touched into this at times and it's so beautiful and so powerful. Mm. And yet at other times I find this thing happening where, um, okay, I want to connect to the hurt that I've caused you or to somebody else. Uh, and then I come upon an emotion where I've been harmed and I get to this space where I think, um, oh, that person's harmed me in just such a similar way to I've harmed this other person that I almost stop myself from feeling the harm that's been done to me. Mm -hmm. And because I feel like, well, I've done it, you know, I need to feel about how I've done it to someone else. Mm. Uh, and in the end, I end up not feeling repentant and not feeling the causal emotions and, and all of this, this kind and so of... repeating I behavior. see it happening in other people as well. Mm -hmm. And in the end, it just enables me to keep harming the other person and keep carrying this causal pain. Exactly. And the irony is if I just felt the causal pain, it's probably very likely the thing I was avoiding when I harmed you and exactly. the other person. And so if I would just have the courage to feel this, this causal emotion, the or humility. The humility. <laughs> you, see a, you see a person who's humble doesn't really need courage. Courage, yeah. <laughs> Do they? <laughs> it's like, um, yeah, I just feel that courage is an important quality to develop. And perhaps we can talk about that in the yeah. oppositions to humility, like yeah. where that fits in. Because but, but I feel that humility itself is much more important to develop because... Because when you're truly humble, you don't need courage. You'll just go ahead and feel anyway. Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. Courage or no. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, next point on this desire, willingness to take responsibility. Um, in this place, I'll desire with all my heart to abandon all of my anger, my justifications, my minimisa minimizations, and my denial. Mm. So, care to elaborate? <laughs> Well, if you think about it, uh, all of those things, anger, justification, minimization, denial, all of those things are surrounding our addictions. Mm -hmm. And our addictions are all the things that we do to get certain emotions satisfied. So even if they're physical addictions, so there might be drugs or drinking or food or, or just hot, hot cup of tea three times a day mm -hmm. or whatever our addictions are that are regular, they're all, they're all embraced to avoid something or to get a feeling of some kind. And and all of those feelings that they're trying to get are all related to an addiction. They're all related to something that we don't want to feel that's underneath it. Mm. Or that we do want to feel that we haven't felt in the past. Mm. You know, a loss of the thing that we, we, we need to feel. And, um, and if we are truly humble, we will let ourselves feel the loss and if we're truly humble, we will let ourselves feel the fear that creates the addiction. Mm. We won't always go for the addiction. So if in our day-to-day -day lives we're constantly going for the addiction all the time, so, for example, we feel cold, so we go and get a hot drink. That's the addiction. Instead of drinking some water, cold water, and then feeling how cold that made us feel yeah. and feeling the fear that it brings up, that's a physical addiction. But let's look at an emotional one. Um, we, we might go along into an audience and um, 
we'd be afraid to put our hand up because we're afraid of what everyone will think of our silly question, right? Mm -hmm. So that's another addiction. We leave our hand down and that way we get to avoid that addiction. We get to avoid, you know, the fact that we, you know, might potentially feel bad by other people attacking us by having a question that they felt was menial or, or, or stupid. Often and then we can get very angry over time because we feel like no one wants to hear from us. Exactly, or, yeah, exactly. we can not... often ma manufacture many angers on top of this addiction as a result. Yeah. But what I'm getting at is that if we are humble enough to feel our addictions, which are either the avoidance of some pain or the desire for some pleasure that we'd never had, mm. so in other words, the avoidance of some loss that we never had in the past, if we, if we are humble to feel that, then we'll never get into the state of anger. We'll never get into a state of denial. We'll never be preventing our emotions through any physical, emotional or spiritual addiction. We will just feel. We will just feel what we feel. We need to feel. And so we have the capacity to grow very rapidly in that state. What most people do is the opposite of that because they're not humble enough to notice their own addictions mm. and not humble enough to feel their own pain. Mm. And... and and they're not humble enough to take responsibility for the fact that they are the only person who can release this pain yeah. either. And, uh, and so in the end, they finish up feeding their addictions. And if we're feeding our addictions, then it's a great indication that we've yet to learn humility. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Mm. yeah, okay. So next one on the list is probably my favourite in this place where we want to take responsibility. Uh, I will desire with all my heart to experience my fear about becoming a trusting child again. Mm -hmm. You see, there are so many damaging things that happen to us as a child that, that the thought of becoming a child again, for most people, is one of the most scariest mm. thoughts they, they could maintain. And a person who's humble is okay about feeling their terror. So a person who's humble would be willing to embrace the terror of becoming a child again in a world that seems to be very adult, attacking and harsh. Mm. The irony is that if you embrace that process, you will release a lot of emotion and the world will become a lot more nurturing because of your law of attraction will change yeah. and everything will become a lot more nurturing. And, and, eventually, and, and it, it, eventually, if we become at one with God in that process, then at least we'll be completely nurtured by the one being in the universe that has the capacity to do so. And we will no longer feel any terror about being a child mm. in that place. So, so what, we, what we need to do is embrace the process. But because of the emotional injuries of our childhood, generally, for most people, they're so terrified about embracing that humble position that they resist humility as a, they take active opposition against humility as a result. Mm. They, they do not ever want to be humble again in yeah. their entire life. And unfortunately, the resistance to humility is what finishes up creating a very harsh law of attraction. Yeah. Because the soul resisting humility is now projecting out on into its environment all of these unloving emotions, which as a result it now must attract in order to correct. Mm -hmm. And so life becomes more and more difficult. And this is why people become harder and harder and harder and harder and harsher and you know they're yeah. you know because they they've they've not softening down to the child again and they're putting a layer and another layer and another layer of hardness every time something unpleasant happens to them that their own soul is now attracting because they're unwilling to become a child again yeah. and i find that's a very sad process that i observe and many people who are aged have got so many layers of hardness uh, around them that they're like tapping on a rock yeah. uh, when it comes to their heart. And, and the reality is humility takes the opposite direction to that. Lack of humility, that's the direction it takes, this heart hardening oneself, hardening oneself with another layer, hardening it again with another layer, with another layer, with another layer of hardness and harshness. That's, that's where we go when we don't have humility. When we have humility, we strip off the harshness, mm. we strip off the layers, we, we, we break down every barrier to the soft heart. Yeah. And, um, and to me, you know, that's where most people go wrong. Most people are still trying to establish hardness, establish, you know, barrier when they nearly to be, need to be ripping off barrier. They need to be getting rid of barrier 
and becoming soft they need to be let let themselves be soft and let themselves be sensitive to the, to the hurt that they feel yeah mm. yeah i had that experience when we were overseas at the start of the year of um you know recognizing how afraid i was and how angry i was at myself for being afraid and how much i was judging this fearful little person inside of me and and i realized you know i had these feelings of feeling alone and powerless and te sexually terrified and violated basically and um it just felt like the worst thing in the world to actually go to those feelings i thought this is going to be terrible uh, alone uh, eventually i kind of prayed and prayed and a series of laws of attraction happened and i found myself just in this shaking petrified place on my bed and um and suddenly my guides were there in this completely loving presence and and I, it was almost like i was feeling petrified but i was feeling loved at the same time and i was saying to them hang on i'm supposed to be experiencing all this terror and aloneness and what's happening and they were saying to me can't you see that when you're resisting humility we can't be with you <laughs> when you just allow this process mm. we can be here with you and you mm. actually it's going to be less traumatic than you are living your whole life at the moment exactly yeah. yeah yeah i just feel that when we have barrier after barrier we don't realize that nobody can really help us mm. when we open ourselves up and become humble when we when we become soft again now everybody who's loving can help us yeah so when we have barrier after barrier after barrier not even a single loving person can can penetrate those barriers mm. and so it's going to feel we're going to feel very alone we're going to be very harsh with everyone else as well yeah. but we're also going to be very alone yeah. and we're also going to feel alone we're going to feel like nobody loves us or cares about us because the reality is we can't feel love in that place to feel love you're going to have to be humble and sensitive and soft and so when you're humble and sensitive and soft you've got the ability to have a lot of helpers with you mm. both on earth and in the spirit world who are humble and soft to what you're going through and you'll feel loved but most people never experience that because they just don't want to have their humility to go through the their belief systems that are false to get to the point where where because they believe they're going to be humiliated rather than yeah rather than you know be loved yeah mm. yeah and i recognize that a lot in myself as mm. things i'm still working through that are blocking me just mm experiencing my terror wherever I am yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah okay so on just to round out this point you've listed some questions that we could ask ourselves mm -hmm. if if we're considering whether we're truly humble in this aspect of a willingness to take responsibility for and experience and release all of the error within ourselves mm -hmm. so the first question we could ask ourselves is do I have a tendency to justify my anger or fear to God others or myself mm. so if, if we're always justifying minimizing our anger and rage then that's an indication that we don't want to have our addictions challenged so we're unwilling to take responsibility for mm. our addictions only we can release our addictions because we are the ones that have them <laughs> and sure other people may have created them but we now have them so yeah. only we can release them and whenever we're angry it's a great sign that we're out of harmony with love so we can go okay i've got another addiction going on here what is that yeah mm -hmm. yeah um do i have a strong resistance about feeling my personal fears mm. okay. so you know the addictions are the layer above the fears so so if i have a big resistance to feeling my fears then of course i'm going to want my addictions mm. met and of course i'm going to want to stay away from my fears and justify why i have them and explain to everybody in the world and god why i should have retain them yeah. god doesn't understand you yeah. know and all those kind of, yeah. and nobody else understands i'm a special case i'm a special case i'm yeah. unique yeah. And, uh, and all of those are uh, demonstrating a lack of humility because if we have humility we'd be going no we're not a special case every fear i have is a false expectation appearing real to me every fear i have once i release it it won't exist mm. and therefore i won't treat it as if it's real i won't i won't you know justify it or anything like that mm. Mm -hmm. mm. Uh, the other questions we had here is do i use my intellect to tell myself i'm over that now yeah. when all indications are otherwise yes i quite often see people um when we have discussions as you know they we, we 
they ask me a question about their law of attraction and I go, well, that's an indication you haven't dealt with this particular emotion. They say, oh, no, I'm quite sure I've dealt with that emotion. And I, and I say to them, well, no, your law of attraction is showing you you haven't dealt with that emotion. No, no, that's other people. Other people are doing that to me. That, that must be their problem. Yeah. And I go, no, no, it's your law of attraction. So therefore, you <laughs> mustn't have dealt with their emotion. Yeah. Oh, no, 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 I can't agree with that. So this is, again, a person not being humble. Uh, a person who's not being humble to the fact that God makes perfect laws. Mm -hmm. And if God makes perfect laws, that means everything that I attract to myself is attracted through something inside of me. And, and if there's pain involved in me as a result of it, then, then I, if I intellectualize myself out of it, I'm just intellectualizing myself away from humility. Yeah. 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 Okay, another question. Do I resist seeing the damage I have done for others? and refuse to take full responsibility for the effects, which is something you spoke about earlier. Yeah, it's a major problem not wanting to take responsibility for the effects. And mm -hmm. I see this in particular with parents with children. They do, most parents do not wish to take responsibility for the effects of what they've perpetrated towards their children. Mm -hmm. They want to blame their children for their children's reaction to the unloving demands of their parents. Yeah. And, and most parents, when they pass in the spirit world, have quite a lot of work to do with that regard, in that regard yeah. because they are not willing to be humble enough to the fact that they weren't such a good parent as they believed they were. Yeah. And, and I feel a person who's truly humble takes responsibility for every creation and if you think about it, our children are one of our primary creations. Mm. They're, they're the most living of all of our creations. Um, and therefore, you know, they are going to reflect the most damage that we've created. Mm. And, and if we're truly humble, we'll see that. And I see that in your relationship with your sons. Uh, obviously, when you had your sons, you were in quite a different condition than you are now. Yeah. And I see you reflecting on your relationship with them or their lives even still mm -hmm. and recognising where your injuries are still being played out by them. Mm -hmm. you, you certainly take responsibility for that. You feel about that. You acknowledge that to them. Mm -hmm. But also you don't allow error. Um, how can I say this? You are firm for love and truth. within. So part of being firm for love and truth is saying, son, you're having this problem because I put that in you exactly. and this is what I've had to look at and how can I help you look at that? Or, you know, I'm always there for you if you need to talk about it. Yeah. But also respect that they don't have to take that either. Exactly. You don't yeah. force them to do it. Mm -hmm. And neither do you allow, um, not that your sons really do this, but I just feel this within you. Um, if a child was to then um, use that, as an excuse, as an excuse for badness for them to be bad themselves mm. yeah. in an unrelated way yeah um you you yeah i don't I see that in your sons but no it, um, but i but i wouldn't sort of i wouldn't be permissive about that either yeah 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 you still firm for love and truth in yeah. in everything yeah. yeah because i see that part of being a parent is actually teaching a child the that their use of will in an unloving way will have consequences for them. Mm. That that's part of taking responsibility for the personal pain inside of them. Yeah. Yeah. So if a, if a person's truly humble, they'll be completely willing to take responsibility for everything they've created. Mm -hmm. And and I suppose the main point there with the children is, children are a main part of your creation when yeah. you're a parent. Yeah. So therefore, you would be willing to see what you've truthfully created in your children rather than blaming your children for what's been created and blaming your children for their inability to forgive you for what's been created yeah. as well. You know, that's all about your lack of repentance as a parent. And a, person, a parent who's truly humble has very little problems with their children. Mm -hmm. Most parents find themselves with a lot of problems with their children and so therefore are not in a very humble place with their children. Yeah. They want to believe that they're their children too, not God's children, which is also an arrogant position and not very humble. So, so I, I just feel that um, taking personal responsibility is a huge part of humility. Mm. And that's why I've given talks about taking personal responsibility. And I see taking personal responsibility as one of the main problems most people face in their lives. They don't want to take personal responsibility. They want somebody to come along and rescue them. In fact, the whole religions have been based around somebody rescuing somebody. You know, a whole Christian religion mm. is about Jesus, me, rescuing everybody who's a believer yeah. from the results of their own actions yeah. and and a god who's a just god would not ever con 
conceive that idea, let alone allow it to occur. Yeah. And the reality is that there is no way that one person can take responsibility for another person's unloving behaviour and actions. Yeah. So, so taking personal responsibility is a key part of our development in humility. Yeah, yeah. beautiful. Yeah. Just a couple of other small points on that one. Um, that we would see our own body shape, our body pains and our illnesses also as an indication. Exactly. You know, yeah. If your body has flaws that you are reminded of every day, you look in the mirror, yeah. you can see what's going on. You know, Like when I look at my body in the mirror, I can see where I've got my problems. Yeah. A lot of people believe I can't and that's why they email me incessantly <laughs> and with, with little messages telling me all of my problems. And, uh, and I also know the underlying emotions that are still present that I'm not humble enough to experience and that I need to work on humility to be to be more humble to experience those particular mm. emotions so that those body uh, things can be corrected. And, and once I am, those body things will be corrected. And, and in the end, perfection in body, mind and spirit is all the result. Yeah. Um, and, and, and it all comes from perf- perfection at the soul level. Yeah. And, but it's unattainable without humility. Yeah. 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 Yeah, beautiful. Thank you. I think we've really covered that point about taking responsibility. Yeah. Do you want to do one more point or finish off? I think it's probably gone long enough now, isn't it, Um, for this session? And maybe we can cover some more points in another session uh, regarding, you know, humility and and the practical aspects of doing it in practice, what it it sort of looked like. Um, I feel probably just to round this out a little, I just feel that for the majority of people a discussion about humility is still pretty confronting mm. um, because, it, because the reality is, is if you look at even the basic points we're raising, most people who believe themselves to be following the path of divine truth, if you like, um, still struggle uh, to a large degree with these basic principles of humility. And if you bear in mind that humility opens the door to truth, then there, there's not much truth able to enter the soul yeah. when the soul's in a lot of resistance to humility. And therefore, there's very little divine love that can enter the soul. And for that reason, uh, many people want to believe they've received divine love when they often haven't because they're yet to receive truth. And they're yet to receive truth because they're yet to get themselves into a, a greater state of humility. And so I feel of all qualities we could develop, humility is one of the best qualities we can ever develop in ourselves. Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. As I said, I think in our first interview, if it was just to be my life's work, maybe I said that in this one, mm. you know, it seems like that would be your life well spent. Yes, and I, I actually believe that of all qualities to develop, if we develop humility, almost all other qualities will eventuate. Mm-hmm. Because if we develop, if you look at the chain of events, if we develop humility, Truth can come to us, mm. divine truth can come to us, and we acknowledge it emotionally. As divine truth comes to us, we had develop a longing for God and, and a longing for the relationship with God. Divine love comes to us. Once divine love comes to us, our soul gets transformed. Mm. We're, we're an ability to live in a place of kindness, compassion, understanding, love. We're no longer motivated by unloving emotions and demands or addictions inside of ourselves a lot of those things dissipate automatically. So if, if you look at the doorway to all growth, in a way, the doorway to all growth is the first part, which is humility. Mm. And it's like without humility, the rest cannot happen. And, and for that reason, I believe that humility has to occur before truth can enter and truth must enter before love can flow. Mm. And, and if we remember that, then we'll see just how important it is mm. to be humble in our lives and how important it is to give up the world's definition of what's good and to start you know, absorbing God's definition of what is good. Yeah. Yeah, it's beautiful. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for the interview today, babe. Yeah. And thanks for Lena and Igor too, who yeah. have uh, been our only sole audience today. <laughs> there they are. <laughs> Look out from behind the. Uh... <laughs> Thanks, guys. Thank you. And uh, we'll probably proceed with the other interview yeah. next week sometime. Yep. Sounds great. Sounds good. Thanks, Thanks babe. Thanks, guys.